bought a farm in Honduras, a banana farm. And as soon as he bought that farm, he ran into a massive obstacle. It was a river. You see, in order to get his new bananas into the States, he had to get them across the river. But the problem was, was all of the bridges in the local area were owned by his competitors. And to make matters worse, his competitors had bribed the local government to make bridge building illegal. So Sam needed to get those bananas across, but he couldn't build a bridge. So what he built instead was a dock. He built a pier on one side of the river. Totally legal, right? It's not a bridge. Then he built another dock. He built another dock. Now he connected these two piers with a raft that was able to be collapsed. And so when the government came knocking and told him, hey, listen, Sam, you have to take this bridge down. Sam told his engineers to sneak out collapsed the raft, they did that, they tucked it away, and then he walked the government official out and said, what bridge? Isn't these old rafts? That's it. So Sam always knew, he always believed in himself, and he always believed in his company, and he, he always knew that there was a way across. So I want to ask you guys, what's holding you back? What is holding you back? Now, if you and I were to sit down and put, to get, put a list together of all the problems that we face in business, it would probably look something like this. You're not having enough sales or customers, or you don't have enough brand awareness. You're not charging enough. You don't have enough cash or runway. You don't have enough quality employees, or you're not holding on to them. Here's the tricky thing about this list. The tricky thing about this list is that these are not problems. These are actually just gaps from where you are to where you want to be. And the gap in and of itself is not the obstacle. The gap is a symptom of an underlying problem. Now, I've had the, uh, the chance to work with a ton of creative entrepreneurs. And based on my experience, nine times out of 10, the underlying problem is a little voice that whispers a big lie. It's up here. It's the internal dialogue of negativity. It's that soundtrack that we hear in our heads as entrepreneurs that whispers these little, these little lies. And you see, over time, these little voices, these little lies, they, they get reinforced. They take root and they grow into something stronger. They grow into beliefs. Beliefs that hold us back. Now, in psychology, they call this limiting beliefs. Limiting beliefs are perspectives that we, they, we believe to be true that actually hold us back. They limit our potential and our actions. Now, the tricky thing about limiting beliefs, especially when you're trying to work on yourself, is that they're really hard to identify in your head. It's really hard to figure out what beliefs are holding you back. So I learned a trick. I can't blank because blank. I'm going to give you guys an example of this. Let's take a look at our list here. Now, nine times out of ten, the biggest problem that creative entrepreneurs have is they don't charge enough. So let's apply our formula to this problem. I can't charge enough because we're a small company. I can't charge enough because I don't have enough experience. I can't charge enough because my clients don't have big budgets or because I don't live in Los Angeles or New York or London, or because I feel like an imposter. Now raise your hand if you can relate to this list. Same here, same here. But as we list this stuff out, now we're starting to uncover limiting beliefs because these items might not be true. But there's good news here. We're not born with these beliefs, and I can prove it. I know this for a fact because I'm a dad. I'm a dad and one of my main responsibilities as a dad is to install limiting beliefs into my kids. For you guys who are parents out there, this is probably familiar, but literally in the past week, I have said, 
if you jump down from there, you're gonna break your neck, right? That is a healthy limit. I'm building these healthy limits. My oldest is three years old, and this little girl is the most self-confident, limitless monster that I've ever met. I love her to death, and because she's so self-confident, she says the craziest things. It's hysterical. And I had the privilege of, of overhearing a conversation between my daughter and her cousin, who's also three years old. And it went something kind of like this. You see, they were, they were playing princess dress up. They had the crown on, they had the, uh, the earrings on, the princess dress. They had mom's high heels on, which were 14 sizes too big. And they were standing at the mirror looking at each other. And the cousin says to my daughter, she says, Willow, you look great. And I was listening to this and I was kind of expecting my daughter to like throw her a compliment back, you know, because that's like the nice thing to do. But no, my daughter looked at the mirror and she said, yeah, I know. I'm just beautiful. And then she turned and she says, I'm really smart too. <laughs> now, how many of you guys would love to have this level of self-confidence when you go into your next sales meeting? Right? I mean, how badass would that be? So we're not, we're not born with these beliefs. We're, th these beliefs are learned. And if we can learn something, we can unlearn it. My hope for you today is, is to take one thing away from this talk that will help you overcome your limiting beliefs. And it's, it's gonna be fun, we're gonna do this in three steps. Here's what we're gonna talk about today. First, we're gonna be talking about challenging logic. And I'm gonna tell you about the day that I quit my job. Then we're gonna be covering getting leverage and the day that I fired all of my clients. And finally, we're gonna talk about unmasking things and the day that I lost $40,000. Does this sound good? All right, I'm gonna give you a little context. I'm a designer by trade. That's what I have to offer the world. I focus on UX, UI, and branding. But I wasn't always a designer. See, really early on in my career, I actually set down my Pantone book, those are, that's color swatches. I set down my Pantone book and my mouse, and I picked up a badge and gun. I was a police officer for five years, but I only spent one year in uniform. I was quickly promoted into special operations unit, and then I was promoted again into a multi-jurisdictional narcotics unit. So I was a narcotics agent. That's me there, uh, right behind a whole table of drugs and guns and money. This was just a Wednesday. There's really nothing special about this photo. It's just, this is what we did. Day-to-day uh, -day responsibilities. I was working with the DEA. I was running wiretaps. Um, we seized millions in illegal cash, drugs, guns, vehicles. It was probably the top spot for a cop in my area. This is the team. Um, they actually scheduled this photo shoot while I was on my honeymoon, so I don't have a cool picture like this, but this is what they look like. Um, we were tactically trained. We kicked in all of our, door, our, our, all of our own doors. We served all of our own warrants. I had a blast, but something was missing. See, I wanted to scratch that creative itch. So what I did was I started freelancing on the side. You see, when you run wiretaps, you have to stay in this little room and wait for the phone to ring. And drug dealers sleep a lot. So the phone doesn't ring a lot. And so all of my friends, they would you know, lift weights in the room or hang out on social media or watch movies. And I worked, I freelanced. And eventually, my freelance side hustle started making more money than I was as a cop. Now that's not saying much because police officers don't make much. But it got to the point where I started to question what I was doing. But at the same time, I was still playing the drug game. It was a blast, I was addicted to the adrenaline. And I honestly really believed that I was gonna do this forever. This is the story about the day that I quit my job. So it was raining this day. And the rain in Savannah, Georgia is like a wall of water. It'd be like trying to walk through the Nile to get into work. So I was sitting 
in my truck, in the parking lot, waiting for shift to start, see if the rain let up a little bit. And my phone rings. And on the other end, it's my best friend. He and I came up through the academy together, and he's actually working in narcotics right now. His name's, well, we'll call him Mr. Smith. Um, that's a picture of him. Um, Mr. Smith is a leader through and through. He's a captain of the Marine Corps, just a really good guy. And whenever we get on the phone, we start talking about business. And he asked me, hey, how's your business doing? How's, how's the freelancing going? And I told him I was, how much I was making. I was like, he said, Ben, why are you still a cop? He's like, why don't you go full time? Why don't you start this business? What's holding you back? Now, this question really, really, I, I struggled with this for a long time. I thought about leaving, but I really honestly thought that I can't. I can't start my own business. I'm not gonna be able to find clients. I'm gonna run out of money. I don't have any awards. I need more experience. I'm not enough. Now, one by one, I rattled off these, this list to Mr. Smith. And one by one, he dismantled them with one single question. Why? Why do you think you're not gonna be able to find clients? You're literally working with clients right now. Why do you think you're gonna run out of money? The money's never been bad. Why do you think you need awards or experience? And I realized in that moment that all the supporting evidence that I had gathered that supported the belief that I can't start a business, it was shattered. It just didn't add up. And, you know, I gotta be honest, guys, once that happened, something changed. I typed my resignation letter right there in my truck, in the parking lot, in the rain. See, when the logic and all of the supporting evidence that you've pulled that supports your limiting belief, when you start poking holes in it, everything crumbles. So my first tactic for you, challenge the logic that supports your beliefs. And, and doing this is actually pretty easy. I have some questions for you. Ask yourself, why do I believe this? Is this really true? Would this be true if I were somebody else? Is this an absolute or are there exceptions? And to give you guys a little context, I could go to McDonald's and get a job flipping burgers for $15 an hour. I was making no money. I was overwhelmed, I was stressed. I thought to myself, I need to find a way to do the work faster and more efficient. I have got to find a way to get more clients. So, being a millennial, I opened YouTube and I typed in how to find clients. I'm glad that I did though, because I found this guy. This is Chris Doe. Chris is an Emmy Award winning designer and he's the founder of both Blind and The Future. Now, Chris, 2013, started making videos about the business of design and I ate it up. So much so that I did something that I've never done before. I sent him a note on Facebook and I said, thank you so much for doing what you're doing. Please don't stop. And he hit me back pretty much immediately and he said, hey Ben, thank you for the note. Do you want to chat? Yes. I mean, I was starstruck. So we get on the phone the next day. And the first thing he asked me is, Ben, what are you struggling with? What do you need help with? I said, Chris, I'm so overwhelmed. I, I just, I'm, I'm so stressed out. I need to find a way to do the work quicker. I need to find more clients. This is the story of the day that I fired all of my clients. <laughs> so Chris says, Ben, you know, I don't think finding more clients is the answer here. These low budget jobs are not worth doing. You've got to charge more. And he paused. He said, you need to fire your clients. I said, what? He said, you need to call up your clients and say, I'm raising my rates. And if they don't agree, you gotta fire them. Now, on the outside, I, I, you know, I was cool, I was calm, I was collected. On the inside, however, it, it was a little different. Because this voice just screamed into life. 
Now, funny as it was, this is what I was thinking. I, I can't fire my clients. I'm not going to be able to find more. I'm going to run out of money. Raising my rates, it's not fair to my clients. I need more experience. I I'm just not enough. I can't do this. Now, I didn't say any of this to Chris because you don't say these things to Chris Doe. But I think that he kind of figured out my hesitation through the silence. And he said, Ben, what's it going to cost you if you keep doing what you're doing? What's it going to cost? And he said, imagine for a minute if you were able to make $100 an hour. How would that feel? What if? I thought about this for a minute. What could I do with all the extra time? What could I do with all of the extra money? What could I do for my family? And in an instant, something, something changed. You know, I realized how much pain that I was in if I didn't change. Honestly, guys, it, the, the comfort zone of my current reality at that point started not to feel so comfy. And I wanted more than anything to jump out of the hole that I had dug myself in. I made 53 phone calls that day. 53 phone calls. And one by one, they said no. And one by one, I fired them. Until, at the end of the day, I had three clients left. Three clients stayed. But those three clients made up more revenue in a month than all 53 combined. I did it. Now, I suffered 50 no's that day, 50 rejections. And we're all creative people here, right? It's the creative stage. Rejection sucks. I could have quit every single call. After every single call I made, I could have hung up the phone and said, I'm not doing this anymore, and salvaged the clients that I had left. But I didn't. The thought of stopping didn't even enter my mind. And so, it boils down to something really, really simple. The thing that changed in here was that I had emotional leverage on the problem. Emotional leverage. See, we all seek pleasure and avoid pain. But what we associate pain and pleasure with, that's learned, that's conditioned. And just in that conversation, Chris had changed my association between pain and pleasure. And if we do this right, we can use this conditioning to our advantage. So the next tactic is to get leverage on that limiting belief. See if you can tweak what you associate with pain and pleasure. Here's some questions to get you started. What has or will this cost me if I continue to believe in this? What does this cost the people who love me? What could I gain if I changed? And how would it feel if it were possible? If the impossible were possible? You see, these questions, when I answered them, it helped me get through that day. And honestly, guys, when I fired my, my clients, my business exploded. I started expanding. I got an office in downtown Richmond. I started hiring my first, second, third, fourth, fifth employees. The clients were coming in. I was able to focus more time on the business than working in the business. Things were going great. I honestly felt at this point that I could not lose. So this is the story of how I lost $40,000. So everything was going great and the phone rings. On the other end of the phone is a massive opportunity. It's probably the biggest company that we had ever had the chance to work with. And they needed a rebrand, which was right up our alley. I mean, it was a perfect project for us. I was super excited. The first phone call went fantastic, but I made one major mistake. I didn't talk about money up front. I didn't ask how much money they brought to the table. So I needed to get some advice. So a couple days later, I sat down with a mentor friend of mine. And I told him all about the project, and I said, listen, I'm gonna charge $10,000. Now this guy had 30 years of experience. He had a design studio with 50 employees, and he just kind of chuckled. And I was like, whoa, 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 
What is it? What is it? He said, Ben, you have got to charge more. This job is at least 70,000 bucks, if not six figures. You have got to charge more. $70,000. Okay. The more I thought about that number, the more that little voice screamed into life. You can't do this. Your company's too small. It's too new. You're too young. Not enough. But I sat staring at the computer for days, putting this proposal together. And finally, I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it. So I put in a bid for $30,000. Right? And we got it. It was a huge win for us. We knocked the project out of the park. It was a major success. But I found out later that the client had a budget of $70,000. We were the budget buy. Our biggest win left $40,000 on the table. Now, I had everything that I needed to win. I had a support system. I had employees. I was scaling up my company. But I chose to listen to that little voice saying, you're not enough. Guys, this one goes really, really deep. You see, when I was a kid, my mom taught me how to read at a very, very early age. And when it was time for me to go to school, the kindergarten teacher realized that I could read in the first week. And so I was plucked out of kindergarten and I was put in the first grade. Now, that's a good thing, right? Skipping a grade is a good thing. I was a smart kid. But I was the smallest kid in class. I was the youngest kid in class. And I felt like I had to do more just to fit in. And that feeling was kind of reinforced at home. You see, I was a smart kid in a poor family. And I carried the family's legacy on my back. And so, I just was left with this feeling that I just was not enough. And I realized last year who that voice is in my head that whispers to me, you're not enough. It's me, but it's not the picture of masculinity, businessman that you see before you today. No, no. It's this kid. This is six-year-old Ben. Let me ask you guys, how many of you would take business advice from a six-year-old? You would? I would. Look at his pants. There's no way I'd listen to that kid. No way. But the thing was, is that I was. So my last tactic for you guys, the last step in overcoming limiting beliefs is to unmask the voice that you hear in your head. This is the thing that really anchors that limiting belief in your mind, and it draws strength from mystery. So we really have to rip the sheet off of that ghost and see who's underneath. So, let me ask you, who are you listening to? And then one question further, should you listen to them? Do they have authority to give you that advice? And then this one drives home. Would that person in your head want to hurt you? In real life, if it were mom or dad, they want to harm you or hold you back? The answer is probably no. Challenge logic, we're gonna get leverage, and we're gonna unmask the voice. Guys, I know this feels like a little bit of psychology, but this has been the key differentiator between growing and not growing for me, personally and in business. And in my journey, I've been able to do some really incredible things. In 2017, my company was acquired. In 2018, I sold a logo for a quarter of a million dollars. And then last year, well, actually this year, we were able to create a hit documentary series that documented the entire process of building a brand. Now, all this stuff's cool, but what I'm really proud of is to have the time to pursue my actual passion. You see, at the future, we have a mission. It's a big, hairy, audacious goal. Audacious goal. And that's to help one billion people make money doing what they love. That's what I want for each and every single one of you. I want you to find that passion and make huge change in the world. The only thing that's standing between you and that are those little voices. So find those little voices and erase them. You guys got this. Thank you so much.